Oh, yeah, we'll come back. I used to walk. Um, we've had a really great supportive um, time with your visit on campus. Yes. So thank you so much for You're sharing welcome. your lived stories and experiences with us. You're welcome. And, um, you know, for you all here in the space, this really is a time to just um, ask questions as it relates to how do we build, establish rapport, build trust with our students, um, and be able to just ask whatever questions um, you may come to mind. So thank you so much for Of course. Me. Of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, he's going to play this video and then I'll go after that. So. A local man has turned his life around while battling homelessness, substance abuse, and mental health issues. Now he wants to share his message of hope with others who may be struggling. For goodness sake, here's Bill Anderson. Four years ago, I was downtown, homeless, dumpster diving. Looking at Freddie Chagog, you wouldn't see the challenges that he has faced as recently as six years ago. I'll never forget when I was downtown and I was begging for change. And I remember being over by the Ritz Carlton, and I remember a lady spitting on me, right? And I remember her throwing money at me. And I remember telling myself, like, this is where I'm gonna die at. Battling both mental health and substance abuse issues, he hit rock bottom. And for him, that pain was the only thing that inspired his journey to change. I always tell people like this with, with substance abuse. Who stops robbing banks if they never get caught? But he says with rehab, prayer, and work, life dramatically turned. And I met Freddie as he spoke about another step in his evolution, a partnership between Delaware County Community College and Westchester University. It's done wonders for me. The program allowed him to enroll in community college using grants, loans, whatever it took, and then transfer into Westchester with guaranteed scholarships, housing, and success coaching. Delaware County taught me how to be a great student. It taught me the system of college. Westchester is teaching me how to be a scholar. Because of this, Freddie's become such a proponent of education and the partnership that he feels duty-bound to travel and share his story through his company, The Message LLC. There's somebody right now struggling who doesn't believe that they can. There's somebody right now who's going to eat out of the dumpster today. There's somebody right now who's going to bury their son and daughter today. If they see and can relate to his new outlook on life. I used to believe that my life got better because I had a better car, I had a better house, because I had better stuff. I finally realized, and college taught me this, my life got better because I became a better person. And as he continues to spread his message, he also has something for the rest of us to consider. When you see that homeless person, be mindful and don't be judgmental because you don't know what somebody got in store for them. came from be a little less judgmental and take care of each other for good that told me, you know, your mom's in sobriety, so you're not gonna be able to do so much in life. Like, I remember sitting in a principal's office and her calling home and saying, Joyce, you can't friend, send Freddie to sh uh, school with AA and NA shirts on. He gonna get bullied. That was my welcome to the world of education. Because my mother chose a life of recovery, the educators that I dealt with looked down on me. And then we wonder why I go through six schools and I don't feel comfortable talking to nobody. Because the past told me that if you're in education and you got recovery, you're different. You're strange. You're odd. You know, one thing, and I can say this because there's you know, this is the faculty and this ain't the students. The one great thing about this job 
is that we have years of experience that they don't know. They don't know what we know yet because they ain't lived life to where we lived at yet. We got power in these jobs. And it wasn't until my life got real blessed to do what I'm doing now that I realized how much education can really change the course of your life. So how's this start? All right, first of all, to know me and to know how I got here. You know, I get asked all the time, Freddie, how did you go from, you know, eating out of a dumpster and begging for change and, you know, you're just spiritually out of your mind and using drugs and alcohol. How did you do all that and in six years you're traveling the country? Here's your answer. Support. I had people like you in education that looked at me and said, I'm going to meet you where you're at. You have a gift and you have things that you can contribute to this world. I don't care about what you got, what you, what you have, about what your past is. What you got is what we're going to take and we're going to make lemons out of lemonade. Or y'all know what I mean. They made me believe that I was worth something and I was valuable. Even though I'm coming to them at the middle age of 30s. Even though I had failed out of six schools. Even though I was in sobriety. Even though I had been through all this stuff. They told me, so what? They told me, we thank you for being here. I'm glad you're a student here. How can we support you? What can we do to get you on your way? Understand this, the students that you see, we talk about the, being intentional. Listen, you get the whole student. If they a dad, you get that too. If they a mom, you get that too. If they got family members going through problems, you get that too. They're not just sitting in front of you wanting to hear about grades. They, some of them are coming to learn about life. So, you need to understand my childhood to understand some things about me. Number one, I got lucky growing up. Very blessed. I got a mother that went to treatment once for five days. By God's grace and mercy, on Monday of this week, she celebrated 20 years of recovery. Never used again. Still can't believe it. That ain't my story. So I start presenting with symptoms when I'm a kid. Start getting high off my asthma inhaler at nine. Therapy. First psych unit. And I'm 10 years old. That turns on 15 psych units. I end up going like 35 treatments that I can even remember. Something like that. Now you wouldn't know this because in school I present well. See, what I learned how to do real early was suppress and suffer in silence. Because what school and the educators I was in front of, I didn't feel very comfortable talking about what was going on in my house. It was a situation where it was about whose resume is better. It was a competition. You know, these wonderful awards of, uh, you know, who's most likely to succeed. I didn't fit that category. I didn't always come to school dressed the best, smelling the best. I had things going on in my house. So bullying and trauma and sexual trauma and all types of domestic violence going on, that's what I was dealing with at home. So when I sat in front of a teacher and they would say things like, Freddie, you really should get in a bath. Yeah, they said that to me. Freddie, you know, you really shouldn't come to class crying. Yeah, they said those things to me. See, my, my, my first run in with educators wasn't so holistic and nice. We have to be mindful how we're talking to these students because we don't know what they're going through. So, I'm dealing with all that mess. End up getting in a very non-healthy relationship. My 20s turns into a, a blur of booze, alcohol, everything you ain't supposed to be doing. I fell out of six different colleges. And let me be very clear. I take my part in that. I absolutely was irresponsible and not ready to be writing theses and MLA papers and, you know, citing sources correctly. No. I wasn't ready. But I also know the school wasn't ready for me either. Because there wasn't systems and there wasn't support built in to help somebody that has the challenges and the things that I bring to the table. And looking back, I see why these statistics are so tilted. I didn't understand. Now I'm starting to see why. 
So, six years ago in that story, this year, by God's grace and mercy, June 21st, I celebrated six years of continuous sobriety. All right? Extremely blessed. Pure miracle. Let me tell you how bad it got. I remember to this day being at the dumpster and the lady from Dunkin' Donuts putting the donuts on top of the dumpster and I remember eating out of there thinking it wasn't that bad and had money in my pocket. I remember the mice running over me sleeping next to the dumpster. I remember how it was to beg for change. So I'm downtown and I'm begging for change. I didn't get to tell the whole story because the news has a thing called time slots. And I remember this lady walked past me and obviously I was at the Rich Carlton because I thought begging for change by the rich would be a good idea because they have money. What I found out was the people that gave me money when I was homeless was a single parent woman with three children with her last 20. The rich didn't give me no money. So, I'm begging for change. Well, he walked past, I said, they call it panhandling. That's the correct educational term. I call it asking for help. So, I said, hey, you know, I'm having a bad day, obviously. May I have some change? And a lady looks at me, she spits on me, and then she says, get a job, nigger. And honestly, that's not what bothered me. I know people can't believe that, but truthfully it's not. Because I got taught early, you, you're not what you're called, you are what you believe. But what bothered me was when she walked past me, she didn't turn around and throw money at me. That was like, what? But I thank her, and it was the best day of my life. People say, how could you say that? Because that reminds me every time that maybe I shouldn't do a paper. Maybe I shouldn't do a homework assignment. Maybe I can skip this class. Maybe I shouldn't go to office hours. Maybe I shouldn't talk to my teachers about what I'm going through. I better because I realize if I'm not continually working on myself and connecting with people, that's where I can go. So, I'm sleeping. I'm next to the dumpster, whatever. Downtown, a guy wakes me up. Angel. He wakes me up. I said, listen, sir, go about your business. I am a failure at life. I'm not good at this thing called life. Let me die. He said, brother, you ain't dying today. I called the ambulance. They're on their way. He hands me a pillow and a bottle of water. He saved my life. I swear it's an angel. I've never seen him again. I've been asking for him. I've been emailing people. If you see somebody that's black and light-skinned and looks like this, tell him to come holler at me. I owe him a steak dinner for real. I go to treatment. Call my mother, mom, I'm gonna change. She said, Freddie, I hope I didn't get sober to bury you because I will. I've given up and accepted that you're gonna die. I'm an only child. My mom gave up on me. I don't know what it was, that changed me. I started reading and treatment. I started believing in myself. I started really getting to this. I stopped counting my days and started making my days count. I get out of treatment, meet my wonderful wife. She says, okay, let's go back to school. I knew education was the key to the new life, but I didn't know how. But I believed in education. I knew it was the answer, but I didn't know how. First day on campus. They got these wonderful things called orientation day. And they roll out the red carpet. Free pretzels and water and coffee and all this stuff. They got all the marketing in the world everywhere. Now I'm a diehard Green Bay fan. Why are you a diehard Green Bay fan? Here's why. So when my mom came home for treatment, I don't, it's weird, like, I was thinking about this the other day. Brett Favre happened to be on television, because I, I grew up watching sports, I never had a choice to be a sports fan. And uh, he was talking about how he's in recovery. I was like, oh, mom, that's somebody like you. She's like, yeah, I was like, all right, that's my new favorite team. That's why I'm a Green Bay fan. I was supporting my mother through him. So, I, uh, yeah, first day on campus, this is how I robbed. Green Bay, now I told y'all, I'm a person in recovery. I have a disease of addiction. Green Bay shoes, Green Bay drawers, Green Bay socks, Green Bay book bag, Green Bay trapper keeper. Y'all old enough to remember what that is. <laughs> Green Bay pencil, Green Bay phone case, lapel. Oh, and I got to represent my culture, a Harriet Tubman shirt. I'm on campus, right? 
And I'm walking, I'm like, yo, what up? My name's Freddie. I'm sober. I've been sober a year. I'm just thankful. I took my mental health medication today. I go to therapy. I'm so grateful to be here. What's up? Now, let me tell you why, what's important. Hear me on this. Healthy people are not attracted to unhealthy people. How do I know that? Because while I was screaming out on campus, I seen some of the faculty and staff looking their nose up at me. Yeah, I can feel that. See, what we don't know is these students are people and they can feel and they can see the energy of when you ain't real. They can tell that when you're just there to keep the turnstile running. Or do you really care? Know how many students told me, hey, Freddie, yo, you're in recovery, yo, go see Miss such and such, because she care about them students. Know how many students told me, yo, you can go talk to him, his door always wide open, you can tell him anything, he a real one. And then there was some people that were like, yo, don't go see them. They gonna give you the paperwork, but they ain't gonna walk you over. They ain't really gonna help you. You think students don't be knowing? You know, we, sometimes we confuse and we think this is a power dynamic. No, education is about serving. So, I go and I meet this lady, Rose. Now, I call her Mama Rose. She's become family for real. Academic advising, one of the most critical places, and the stats show how bad that affects retention. Students don't know what retention and pedagogy and fear institutions are. I only know because of what I do for a living. They ain't trying to hear that. They're trying to hear, how do I graduate, how can my life get better, and how can I put food on the table? So miss them with all this theoretical mumbo jumbo mess. So I sit down in front of Rose and I go in there. Nervous, I'm shaking, I'm nervous, right? She says, hey, welcome. She said, we're so glad to have you here. I said, really? She said, absolutely. She's like, do you want an orange? Do you want candy? I was like, wow. I was like, you, this stuff is free. Yeah, get whatever you want. Wow. Thank you for being here, Freddie. We love new students. She said, so tell me about yourself. I said, well, I want to study. She's like, I can ask you that. Tell me about you. What? I said, you care about me? She said, of course I do. Who are you? I said, well, I'm in recovery. She said, yeah. I said, oh, y'all like people like that? Because I had never faced educators that cared about people in recovery. The only educators I faced is 15 credits, walk to financial aid, thanks for coming, turnstiles keep running. Hence why Joe Biden's trying to figure out how these student loans got so bad. Y'all smart enough to know if it's on a president's desk, it must be an issue. Student loan debt is the highest debt in America. How'd that happen? And a job that's supposed to be about service. Wow. I'm already within 10 minutes on the campus feeling like I'm going to make it because a woman is sitting in front of me telling me, you're going to do it. She says to me, Freddie, I don't care about your grades. You're going to get straight A's. I said, how do you know? She said, because you're intelligent. It's not about your grades. It's about how healthy you can be outside this building. My first meeting. I said, oh, all right. I said, what do, what do, you, what do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want me to do. She said, first thing we're going to do is, she's like, I want you to take these classes. I said, why? She's like, you're energetic. She's like, these teachers will match up because you like raising your hand a lot and all that. And I'm like, wow. She's like, yeah, when you look for classes, don't just look about what the class says it is. Find out about the teacher. She's teaching me how to move. She then says, all right, now we're going to go to financial aid. I said, you going to walk me over there? She's like, of course. I was like, you got all the students. She's like, they can wait. I'll do the same for them. Now, I know the woman got children, I know the woman's married, I know she got a life. If it means that she got to be late, that's what it means. See, education is about doing more with less. Sorry. She decided that even the job description says this, I'm going to do A. She walked me over there. Do you know how empowering it was to have the woman beside me walking me over, saying hi, and when she would stop and say, hey, this is Freddie, this is my uh, new advisee, and you know he's on here, he's going to do well. Do you know how empowering that felt my first day to know that, man, I'm going to be all right? Wow. I found somebody that cared about Freddie. 
She walked me over to financial aid. Not only did she walk me over, she didn't walk me over and say, okay, you're good now, see that person. No, she sat me down and said, hey, this is Freddie. He needs help with his FAFSA, walking through it. Can we set up a meeting if you're busy right now? And when you set up the meeting, I'll be there with him. She walks you through financial aid. Then they take me over to placement testing, because you know, America, we got to test you. Because testing come with grants and fundings. Ah, that's what students don't know. So they take me up to the placement test. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I, I would really like to know who designs these tests. Maybe I should go look into that. So at middle 30s, I'm taking a placement test, right? I take the placement test, and it comes back. And they say, congratulations, Frederick, very kindly. They're like, I'd like to congratulate. I said, why? They said, you have placed it in the remedial courses. And I was like, yes! I didn't know that remedial were the lowest courses offered on campus. I thought remedial meant AP. I'm running around the campus. Yo, I got into the AP thing. I'm calling my mom. Yo, mom, you'd be so proud of me. I'm in remedial. I don't, <laughs> I don't even realize what I'm in. So finally, somebody compos me. I said, let me holler at you. I said, what's up? He said, Ramito is the lowest courses. So all that swagger I had when I walked on campus, I walked left with my head down. I get home. And remember when I told you all healthy people aren't attracted to unhealthy people? Before when I had got my wife, she's 54, I'm 39. I can only say her age because she ain't present. <laughs> we met in, in meetings and we were feeding the homeless and doing the healthy things. I said to her, I said, Kim, like, I love you, but this ain't going to work. You're further in life developed than me. I don't have anything. I just want to be sober. I'm in a shelter. She said, Freddie, it's not about what you have. It's about who you are. That other stuff, you can get that. I was like, wow, man, like, somebody care about me besides my W-2 and resume. I had never found that before. So I get home, and I'm crying. I said, Kim, it's over. Education's passed me up. She said, what? I said, I'm done, man. I said, listen, I'm going to be in class with 18-year-olds, doing wrong with people, all that. I said, look, man, like, I messed that up. Education has surpassed me in life. The best thing I'll do is work at a rehab center, and I'll just settle, and it's cool, and I work at Panera, and that's good enough. She said, hell no. You're going to class tomorrow. I said, why? She said, you're going to class. Save my life. So I go to class, English 025, Jamie Kelly DiMaggio, changed the course of my natural life. So in class, she says, all right, people, I'm going to give you an assignment. It's called identity. And I'm going to grade this based on content, not grammar. So I raise my hand. Oh, and I'm one of them students where I raise my hand 100 times. <laughs> yup. They have no problem squeezing the juice out of my pocket, so I'm going to squeeze the juice out of the class. And let me be very clear, the students can notice when you're getting bothered. And I would raise my hand a hundred times, and unlike other professors I've had, instead of her saying, what, Freddie? Again, Freddie? No, she said, Freddie, I love your enthusiasm. I'll tell you what, save those questions, because after class, I want to walk through those questions with you. You see how she moved with that? So, I said, are you sure now? Because I got a story to tell. She said, that's what I want. I want it raw and real. So I wrote out about how I begged out the dumpster. I wrote about all the things I've been through. See, for a long time, I was too ashamed to tell you what, what I was going through because I was worried about what you thought about me. She was teaching me, I need you to advocate for yourself. She was teaching me that this building ain't about a certificate. You know, the one thing I've learned from her class is college should not just change my bank account. What these students don't know is college should change your soul as well. You know, when parents drop, or whoever, when, 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 when people are dropped off at school, they are entrusting us as the educators with the degrees and the certifications and the CVs to help them become better people. If we can take the tuition checks, then we can care about who they are. 
So, after class, after a few class sessions, she comes up to me and she says, Freddie, there's life in this paper. We're going to get you published. I said, what's that mean? Because unbeknownst to many, most students don't know with abstracts, and publications, and the gatekeeping that goes on with these journals, and how expensive they are, and traveling, and conferences, and all this different stuff. So a conference comes up, because I'm speaking at a treatment center, and they tell me about it, and I tell her about it. She says, you're going. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, I'm scared. She said, good, walk through it. So I go, and I'll never forget it. It was at St. Joe's Conference, Marginalized to Empower. Now, I'm the only student at this conference. It's all these people with doctorates and books, and I'm there, right? And I'll never forget, my pastor had bought me my first suit. So I go to the conference, right, and it's a room full of educators. It's all these people, and they're talking all this whole pedagogy and retentions and, oh, this feeder institution and all this mumbo. Gut. I'm like, what? See, students don't understand that. They just know this class and the syllabus. They don't know the network and the information that you got. So you can't talk to them in that language because they don't know. So I'm sitting there, right? And I'm just happy to be here. My wife gave me a debit card, said, go ahead and go, because I couldn't take the bus because I didn't want to sweat whatever. So I got this nice Uber, right? I thought I was the man. And I end up on there, and they had coffee. I mean, y'all been to these conferences. I mean, just insane. I'm, I'm, listen, I drank 30 cups of coffee that day. I couldn't believe it. I had my business card. I'm like, hey, my name's Freddie. Blah. Right? I know they thought I was crazy. And I remember getting the sheet, and it said breakout sessions. And I'm like, what's that? So I tap somebody. I'm like, yo, what's a breakout session? And they were like, that's just a fancy word for a group. I said, so why the hell they just write group? Why are they writing breakout sessions? She's like, well, that's how it is. I was like, well, that's dumb. So I'm reading this and don't know what, like, and you know what I'm learning about life? The successful people, it's not about really intelligence. And, and I'm going to just keep it on. You know what it's really about? Your network. It's really about the support. When I spoke at Stanford and I spoke at some other elite, school, elite schools, what I learned was it's not that them kids are smarter. They're just more supported. They just got access to stuff that other kids don't got access to. So I go in there and I'm raising my hand in that one. And afterwards, she, come, we got, she said, hey, I know the op-ed ed editor at the Inquirer and she's looking for stories. She's like, does your school have a collegiate recovery program? I said, no, what's that? She's like, that's where people recover. I said, I wish they would. They need to. She said, you want to write about it? I said, yeah. She's like, you got a story? I said, I got this paper from English called Identity. She said, deal. She calls the op-ed director. Op-ed director and me get together. Because the assignment got personal, it gave me more hunger to do it, which then turned into my first publication. I'm driving down New Jersey, my wife, my daughter, we're family recovery, we're going to a meeting on the beach and we go get pancakes. I'll never forget, I'm getting a call, everybody's blowing me up, Freddie, you're on the front page, of what? Get to the store, buy about $200 of newspapers, true story. And I'm telling the lady, cashier, I was like, that's me right there. We get outside, my daughter's here, my wife's here, open the paper up. My daughter leans back, was like, that's dope. You know what that felt like? After six failed colleges, after all types of trauma and bullying and being told I couldn't and not making the most likely to succeed list and all that drama, man, did it feel good to be on the front page of the Philadelphia op-ed section inquire saying, in college and recovery, my story mattered. All that I had been through, it mattered. And the reason it mattered is because somebody in your seats saw me for who I was and said, we need to get that out of you. We need to talk about this. You need to advocate because somebody need to hear it. And you know what's real deep about what I'm doing? I don't get calls from students about help. I get calls from administrators about what they going through. I couldn't believe it. I got emails from people working in colleges, administrators, schools I went to and where I'm at texting me like, yo, I'm struggling with this. How did you move with that? Can you help me? Facts. One thing this job has taught me is I got to serve before I ever lead. 
So that sets the tone. My first assignment I get published. Guess what that did? I took every assignment real after that. Guess what that also did? Because I had Rose, because I had that teacher, they taught me how educators should deal with me. So when I go into a room full of educators now, I walk in there expecting a certain way. So that sets the tone. I get a call from a school in New Jersey. Hey, we read your story. It's lovely. We'd love you to speak down here. I'm like, yeah. They're like, how much do you charge? I said, what? You pay for this? They're like, yeah, what's your fee? I was like, I don't have one. I got to call you back and find out how much I charge. I called my mentor. She said, do this. I didn't listen. I got burnt. My first school I ever went to in New Jersey, they got me. I learned contracts. Ooh, they got me. I paid $100 Uber to get down there. They said, come down. We'll take care of you. Paid $100 to get back. Nothing. When I got down, she said, we'll write you a letter of recommendation. I said, no doubt. And you know what's funny? I worked at Panera. Guess what was catered? Panera. <laughs> Never forget it. To this day, it's wild. I'm writing my first book. That's like one of the first things we're talking about. <sighs> so I go there, right? So I get straight A's. I call my mom. After a couple semesters, I get straight A's. I said, Mom, I got straight A's. I'm doing it. She said, you want to be special? Do it again. Administrator told me, she said, there's thousands of students here to get straight A's. What's different from you? You better figure out why you're here. So what Rose did, I get a call from the president of the school because I advocated for myself. The president, what I realized is they read these magazines and newspapers. And when they see something that might not be so popular, they tend to take care of that. She called me. She came to come to my office. Oh, they read the red carpet out. Breakfast, anything I wanted. Oh, this is Freddie, get him whatever he wants. I was like, oh, wow. I'd never been in a president's office before. It was different. She said, listen, I, I, I read what you wrote. What do you need? I said, what do you mean? She said, we want to support you. You tell us what, what you need. I got you. She said, but I need a favor from you. I said, what? She said, I need you to walk with integrity. That set the tone of my rest of my collegiate experience because I had somebody in power willing to be behind me as long as I did my part. But that started with an advisor who gave me belief and then showed me how to move in these rooms. My advisor then says, okay, Freddie, you met me, you got published, now I'm gonna take you to the next guy who's gonna show you some more stuff. She took me to Dr. Mickens. Dr. Mickens said, hey, I heard your story. I'm gonna show you how to get speaking gigs. I said, what do you mean? He said, you gotta go to these conferences where these educators come and then they'll bring you into your school. He's like, but you have to apply. He gave me the sheet, I looked at it. I said, this is Chinese. Abstract, 150 words. CV, I didn't have no CV, I worked at Panera. I had one publication. There's people that was going there that had CVs 20 pages long. I had half a page, and I made the font real big. I thought they was gonna cut me out. I made the font like 22, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> I submitted it. The lady calls my mentor, calls Dr. Mickens back and says, hey, um, we've never had an undergraduate student uh, present here before. He said, what's wrong with his paperwork? She said, nothing. He said, so I don't see what the problem is. I go to my first conference, I present. I get a call from Clarion University to speak. By then, I knew how to whip up contracts. Dr. Mickens then takes me down to meet Stephanie, who works in Campus Life. Guess where Stephanie's from? She's a secretary that's a diehard Green Bay fan. When I graduated from Delaware County Community College, Stephanie told me I'm so proud of you and gave me my first tickets ever to see Green Bay play in a hotel. Then I meet Brianne, who's in the same office. Guess what Brianne does? Brianne brings in speakers to the school. So guess what she said? Freddie, you want to do this for a living? I bring in speakers. Let me teach you the business. Then they take me upstairs to the lady that does SNAP and counseling. That lady says, hey, I know you get SNAP. Let me show you some other programs that we can help you with. Then the janitor in the school becomes my homie. We start a book club together. Then the cafeteria worker every time I'm walking, because now the school has put me on the face of the front cover of their yearly magazine that they send out to thousands and thousands of everybody in the community. So now I'm the face of the school. Cafeteria worker sees me. Hey, Freddie, I'm proud of you. God is good. Her daughter was struggling. I'm so proud of you. You are the man. Thank you. Bless you. Keep, keep going now. Do you know what it meant on days I was struggling and going through stuff when I would see the cafeteria worker, when I would see the janitor worker, and they'd tell me, keep your head up? See, what happened was it really became a village of uplifting me. It became family. So when I walked on campus, I felt like I can't lose because the people here don't just care about my grades. They care about me. 
They told me your success is my success. I said, you got your master's. She said, Freddie, that's the paper success. I'm talking about life. So yes, I got this degree at home and it hangs on my wall. But what about the intangible life skills that y'all taught me? How y'all made me a better husband. Rose told me the first thing she sat at me. She said, Freddie, your success is not going to be dictated about your intelligence. I need you to clean up your house. I need you and your wife to get in therapy. I need you to be a better father. I need you to be a better husband. I need you to work out. I need you to yoga. I need you to do all those things. I said, why? She said, because a healthy foundation is going to give you a life of rewards of fruit. Man, was she right. I started doing what she told me. And then before I looked up, Phi Theta Kappa. Before I looked up, 10 scholarships. Before I looked up, I had a company. Before I looked up, I graduated Delaware County Community College with a 3.75 GPA. I received 10 different scholarships, and when I left, I was selected for All-State P Academic Team, which gave me a full ride to any partial school in the state of Pennsylvania. I felt out of six colleges, felt I was a dummy. I leave community college. Before I leave, my wife tells me, she said, hey, I'm going back to school. I said, why would you do that? You have a good career, you're doing fine. She said, seeing you work hard makes me want to work hard. You taught me it's more than just money. I want to do what I'm passionate about. See, this company and my passion and wanting to do this has not just changed my life. I have made a difference on everybody around me because people like you made me believe that I matter. Do you know how far I can go just telling a student, hello? Just saying to a student, just walking by them and stopping and saying, hi, how are you? And they're like, oh, I don't know you. You don't need to know me. I just want to tell you hi and welcome to the college. They looking up to us. I didn't realize until I started speaking, and I get it because I speak, but I didn't really realize they really looking up to us like how I do this. Y'all know education is a windy, weird road. And if you ain't networked, if you ain't in, if you don't know this, if you don't know that, man, good luck. My first conference, I was naive. My first national conference that I spoke at as a panelist, I'll never forget it. Now, I want y'all to understand, every conference I ever go to and I speak, I'm the lowest degree in the room. You know why? Because what I learned is that these conferences, they want a master's or doctorate level to be keynote. But I got something that they can't find in a book, experience. See, what I speak on, I don't have the PhD yet, but I got the PhD in life. So they got to respect it. So, I'm at this conference and this provost and all these people, and they're like, Freddie, when you go, you gotta make sure you got an elevator pitch. I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, that means that, no doubt. So I get in there, I'm like, hi, my name's Freddie. I have, wear two hats. I claim I thought it was clever. I wear two hats. I'm a student and I speak for a living. Never forget this lady said this to me. She says, young man, first thing she says, I'm 30, but young man, what are you doing keynoting and you haven't even gotten your doctorate yet? I said, oh, that's the business I'm in? And I ain't just made my proudest moment, but I'll keep around it. I said, have you eaten out of a dumpster? She said, no. I said, I guess we both didn't pay our dues. I said, I'm not here by initials. I'm here on experience. But that was good, because that woke me up to what I'm walking into. Most students don't know that. They don't realize that some of y'all think like that. I'm not saying people in this room. I'm saying some in the business do. So when they looking up to y'all, they thinking that deep down, no matter what they got and who they are, is good enough. They don't know that some people only think they ain't good enough unless they got a doctorate. I need to send that lady a bottle of apple juice. Thank her for that. Because that kept me fueled and hunger. And since she said that, by God's grace and mercy, I've had over 40 keynotes on my CV. I have made history where I've spoken at. I got a call from the National Institute of Staff and Development. The guy told me that runs it. He said, in my 40 years of being involved in this conference, we've never had an undergraduate student speaker. We've always had masters, doctorate, and government officials. I said, why me? He said, because of a speaker of your elk. Because of your story, 
you're the real expert. What we need is not more doctorates. We need more people to tell us how to move with these doctorates. I called my mom crying. She still couldn't believe it. I graduated Delaware Community College. I didn't go to Westchester. It's in the middle of COVID. Woo! No, I always say the best thing about COVID, it exposed the foundational issues we had in education. So let me tell you when I got to Westchester what I learned. Keep hearing people ask me, how do I connect with students more with COVID? We make this too hard, people. We're reading these long theoretical papers on pedagogy. It's this simple. Be nice. Say hi. It really ain't that difficult. Let me give you an example. The first class I had, when I get on there, the lady says, Dr. Munns, I call her Aunt Munns now. That's my auntie, for real. Everybody becomes, I call it the Freddy Village. There's a group of Panera moms, and then there's a group of other people, and they're all in the Freddy Village. And she gets on class and she says, hello everybody, blah, 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 blah. The first 10 minutes of this class is dedicated to how are you? This is an open space of non-judgment to talk about whatever you need. Not, hi, welcome class, chapter three. All right, homework assignments, dude. Nah, uh-uh. Nah, nah, nah. How are you? Because I understand some of you ain't coming from a two-parent home with elderberry and traveling. Some of y'all are feeding your sisters because mom and dad is in jail. Some of y'all trying to get lights paid. Some of y'all are sleeping in your cars. Some of y'all might have got out of jail yourself. Some of y'all struggling with drug and alcohol addiction. So instead of worrying about one demographic, I'm going to open it up and I want everybody on here to talk about how you doing. And if it means extra class time taken, then that's just what it means. Wow. You know how far that goes? Because when that class ends, you know what the students be saying to me? Man, she cool, man. I really need to talk about that, man. Like, thank her, man. Dr. Munns, that's my homie for real. After class, she asked to talk to three different students. She'll pick up three different students out and say, hey, I just wanted to talk to you. I, I just want to see how you're doing. What can I do better to help you? No ego. This woman in been public, got doctors, all that. None of that. Okay. So, the other thing, I'm a student that goes through Office of Disabilities. So, and, and this is real critical. One of the teachers, what she did was, when we took a test, she made it so whenever that test was done, the ones you got wrong, when you took it online, it went back to only those questions. Not retake the whole test again, just those questions. And I remember asking her, I said, you don't know how much that helped. I said, why'd you do that? She said, because I learned that when I, when I, when I make something, I make a test, I have to think about the whole student. I have to think about intentionality and I have to realize, and she says the pedagogy shows that, that it works better with that. I said, thank you so much, that really helped. I said, because I have test anxiety, so when I go back and retake a test, I'm thinking about all that mess. She said, no, Freddie, it's already hard enough to take it once. Just go back to the ones that you need to answer. That simple. That didn't take no theoretical dissertation. That didn't take, you know, it kills me. Um, what are you doing today? Oh, we got employee work day. They're sending us off to this conference and we're going gotcha. to, it's simple. Hi, how are you? How can I help you? And what can I do? What do I have in my network that can help you get to the next level in life? If you know a conference, share it in your class. If you know a reporter, share it in your class. If you know a newspaper, share it in your class. Give them what you got so that they can get where you got. See, we gotta realize, a lot of them coming behind you don't have the doors open that you got. What if they're the first family member that ever went to college? We gotta think about those things. So, I end up graduating Westchester University. I, my wife graduated May 14th with her master's. I graduated ne the next day, summa cum laude was selected to commence a speaker, got to honor my mom. I'm now in school to get my MPA, I'm taking online classes because my business is thriving by God's grace and mercy. I spoke in Memphis, I went to um, JFF conference, I was a panelist, I spoke at LSU, then I went to South Texas College during convocation. Here, I'm speaking at Yale, I'm going to Denver, I'm doing Gateway Technical Community College and stuff. So, I came in class with nothing and I'm now four or five years later, two degrees, working on my third, full speaking company, making history with a family and blessed. How did that happen? Y'all. 
So I'm going to ask y'all, and I'm going to leave y'all with this. Tonight, when you're sitting in your beds and you're thinking about this loud, crazy black kid that was in here screaming, I want y'all to ask yourself a question. What is your legacy here? Because every day you walk in this building, you're leaving a footprint. Students, always remember how you treat them. I'll tell you what mine is. Y'all taught me that my job now is to empower people to empower other people. It doesn't matter how rich I get. I'm supposed to be lifting while I'm climbing. Because the same people I see on the way up is going to be the same people I see on the way down. So now it ain't about me. It's about making sure that everybody got a chance. Thank y'all for allowing me to share. My name's Freddie. I'm done and I'm tired. <laughs> For real. <laughs> Whew, I just spoke four times in two days. Lord, have mercy. All right, so I'm open for questions. Ask me whatever you want. I'm open book. Um, so that is a very good question. And what I've learned in my experience is build it in the curriculum, right? So have an icebreaker, have a, have a assignment where they do practice because that's how I got to where I was at. I didn't get here on my own. I got here because the assignment was advocate. That's how you do that. Build it in. That's a really good question. Go. Yes. Right. So rock bottom for me was that lady spit on me and called me N word. Is that was that what you're talking about? Like. Yeah, so I, this is what I've learned. First of all, this is a process, it's a journey. There's no pill that solves the problem. My rock bottom is when I stopped. That just happened to be the last thing that I remember and I couldn't go through no more. But somebody else's might be more. For me, my rock bottom was I gave up on life, and I was okay with dying. It just so happened that an angel appeared, <laughs> and when he appeared, I took the help and ran. Enablement kills people. Wait, so we're talking about helping people. Yes. Yes. Yeah, what do you, I, I mean, because I, I want to answer, you're, you, what are you saying, like, just talk to me more, because I just want to make sure I understand right. I'm giving you the best answer that I possibly can. Well, I'm finding that if I help too much, that I don't let somebody hit rock bottom. Yeah. Um, so it's a really great question, because I have a daughter who got 18 months sober, right? And me and her, mo her mom has seven years. I have six years. We had to learn how to let go. I mean, for us, letting go was she had to get arrested. She had to get a DUI. And we had to let her go to Florida to start a new life. If we wouldn't have, we were in the way of her growth and maturation. And when you're loving somebody that has this illness, it's not natural. Because it isn't natural to let your kid stay in jail. It's not natural to let your kid be homeless. It's not natural to let them feel pain. But with this illness, you have to go through pain. Because pain is going to be the only thing that's going to change behavior. That's what I have learned in my experience. So there's boundaries. There's boundaries. And if you don't set them, they're going to run with them. So there's boundaries. And you got to ask yourself, what is your boundary? That's the biggest question of all. How much is too much? I'm going to jump in here with you. Mm -hmm. um, Casey, mm -hmm. right. relax. Yeah. 
It's over. Thank you. Yeah. My stature is right because when they talk to me about stuff and when they say stuff to me, I know what they're talking about. But I didn't know that when I came on campus the first day. I didn't know about funding. I thought they just paid me out of, they just paid me because the college had it. I didn't know about certain departments. I didn't know what campus life meant. Students don't got the access y'all got. Y'all got access to information. So when you share it, we all get better. Right. These things are so. Yeah, it's a good reminder to slow down and say, uh, you know what? If you don't live this, every you don't day, know it. You don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Right. And then the other point is, I'm glad you said this. One of the things, because you can't share it all. I mean, there's only so much time. But one of the issues I ran into quick was people telling me, like I say, look, like I, I speak for a living. And when I said that, I, I don't think they really understood until I would send them a promo, and they'd be like, oh. I'm like, yeah, so I gotta miss your class. You gotta miss my class. Education's your number one priority. Good, you can send me my uh, light bill next month. Thank you. Anyway, th the point is, I had to learn how to move with that. Like, how to tell them, like, look, I've been blessed to do this, and, you know, I gotta miss this class. And so, like, I remember one time a teacher had told me, she's like, you making 5,000 speech, I don't even make that. And I was like, why are you mad at me? You know what I mean? Like, but, but, but that's the stuff that I be running into. Like, so I just want y'all to like, hear that. Like, I learned real early, like, everybody ain't happy about this. So there's going to be some people I meet that be like, uh. Now, in grad school, they've been cool. Like, because I'm doing it online, and the teachers really have embraced it. Like, all right, let me know. I'll let our classmates know. Like, the one teacher said it's extra credit if they went to my session. You know what I mean? Being real cool about it. But everybody wasn't happy, you know. And that's OK. That's OK. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah you're, you're Mom wrote, she brought me this watch. Yeah, that's my homie. <laughs> well, I graduated, she got me this. I love her to death. You know, it's funny, she's a counselor now. She left the college. She's a therapist. And so I think your, your Rose example with um, the relationship of the importance of the relationship of academic progression to the success of students. Critical. in our relationship. 
relationships as we interact with our students, whether it's just the one semester that they're here, um, and move them through those stages of trust and, and developing those relationships of trust. And that's why I have to talk about, like, you know, what does it look like to be in my house? You know, what does it look like to build a relationship with somebody who is in my house versus, like, how do we move them from the sidewalk to the lawn to maybe the front porch <laughs> to the home, right? Um, metaphorically speaking, right? Like, <laughs> you know, but thinking about what that process looks like in our student engagement and student interaction is really critical. Um, again, because we don't know what students' lived experiences are. And so it's really interesting, I was sharing with um, Bill Bean earlier that a student reached out on my cell phone and I was on the phone with a student at seven in the morning and they were crying and really stressed and having a lot of anxiety and you know I could have not answered the phone at seven in the morning but I was there with that student right and so that relationship is progressing progressing from the sidewalk to hey I need help right. you're in my lawn you know and and that trust relationship is so critical for our student success yeah and, and, and to her point because I, I don't want y'all to think that I just met them and we got cool and school when I made my first, I made my first real money in speaking, I took the whole check. I took five homeless people off for steaks. I got a two-hour deep tissue massage. I got a mud bath. I went on there. My mentor called me and says, do you want to go to jail? I said, what are you talking about? She said, Freddie, you got to pay the taxes. I said, oh. She said, DA, you work for yourself now. But because I had that relationship when I met her at the building, guess who did that? Stephanie. She's the one that taught me about getting a Vanguard account. I didn't know how to manage money. Stephanie said, hey, take this out and put it in here. Guess who taught me how to get my first credit card? Rose. Dr. Mickens told me how to buy my first car. I don't call him just about school. I call him my life. Brianne, y'all, I'm going to up my speaking fee. How I'm moving this. What I do. Here, Freddie, do this. They became lifelong, real life family members. Because I don't, I don't know how to have credit cards. I don't know how to do Vanguard. I don't know about portfolio. Other questions? Just a comment. One of the things we talk about is sharing the information. We, like the orientation or that first week of school, dump so much on students who don't understand our label and the information. That is too much for them to, to grasp in that short period of time. Right. And that's what's hard to get it, get them to understand. Because you know, a week later, two weeks later, they're going to ask a question again, somewhere along the line that we've already explained. Right. And how do you, how do you get to each student those questions that they didn't grasp the first time? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, run one day, day, right? Um, one thing I do know is, uh, and this is this is this goes back to kind of. I, academic advising. I learned real quick, even what I do, you're going to answer the same question about 300 times. I don't know how many mentees I call, call me and ask me the same thing that I just told you 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to be real patient. Um, the other thing too is, I believe there's a way to, get, to, to deliver that. Right? So like the first thing you come on, we're trying to pow, pow, pow. But I also take an echo to the programming. Like, Maybe there's a way in some programming and some stuff that this session is only about information. This next session is only about that. Yeah, that's a struggle. There's no answer to what I can say is programming, maybe, you know, figuring out a way to deliver it. Yeah. Other thoughts, other questions? Yeah, that's anything y'all want. Where do you go from here? Oh, hmm. So, I'm in grad school online. First thing I learned about grad school, I got a lot to, it's way easier than I read. Way easier. Um, I, at least that's my, um, that's my experience. Um, I learned the world works on policy and funding. And so I'm trying to be in those rooms that historically don't look like me and don't come from my background so that I can try to change the material. That's one. And then the other thing is, I'm writing my first book as we speak. That's a project in Excel, and it's so good. Because it's not so much the writing about it, but I got to visit some trauma. Um, and that ain't easy. So going to therapy, take my meds, obviously, you know, staying sober. Um, 
it, it, write the book, the MBA, and, and continue to build the speaking company. And, and, and how that goes, like my fees up, okay, like, you know, traveling more, learning that, because that, that's all another life itself too. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing, just continue to grow. Build a company, book, because I had a lady tell me, she said, Fred, she's New York Times with songs, she don't know her own stuff, she does a, a eating disorders. She said, why are you, you know, in the school? I said, that's how I get speaking about in these conferences. She said, once I wrote a book, I never called to school again. I said, oh, she said, work smarter than I'm already. So, learn this business, because there ain't no, there's no degree for this. It's a life job. So, that's where I'm at. Is it your hope to speak through your career, or do you, are you? Um, I got to ask that. That's a really good question. The goal is, and I was telling her this, like probably three, four major conferences a year to be able to live off of as far as the business side of it. And then the other part is finding out where these people that dictate policy and where they be at, to talk to them and say, hey, allocate this funding in this way. And then get people that come from my background, get a bureau where I send them out. Because I keep hearing, Freddie, we need more of you. And I don't want more of me. I want more of other people because we need diversity. So I'm trying to bring people from where I'm at to show like people do recover. People do stop using drugs and alcohol. It's okay to take mental health medication. Like I'm trying to change how we see it. So that's the job. And then the other thing is get these colleges to get on board with it. You need a program and a, and a wing separate just for these students. Because they don't learn like maybe A, B, C, D, and that level. And I would probably add that representation matters. I yeah. appreciate what you're saying, and I think representation matters because what we noticed in the student sessions earlier is just a connecting of maybe there's aspects of, their, of your story that connected to their own experiences. And the fact that you're able to speak on it and humanize even their own experiences was very powerful for our students that were in the space. And so there was a lot of reactions of, thank you for sharing. Thank you, I'm also recovering. Thank you, I've had similar type of experiences. And I think that that, that really tells us then that we have a very diverse um, population of students with um, varying needs, right? And so coming back to your question earlier on like, what do you do? I think there's a healthy level of finding that support and challenge in, in helping our students um, you know, with their, their struggles or helping them identify needs or giving them the language and also um, holding them accountable as well in their own learning and their own advocacy. But we can't just start from a place of you better learn how to advocate for yourself. Rather start from a place of here's how you advocate, right? So I was talking to a student earlier and I said, did you reach out to your faculty? How about instead of approaching it in the classroom, what about visiting after before office hours? And then sit down and express, this is the things that I've been bringing up in class, these are my concerns, this is how I'm feeling. I understand that this might feel like power dynamic, power differentials, I get that. How does that feel to you? Let's have this conversation so you are prepared. And so coaching them through is an important part in taking those extra steps. Because at the end of the day, we're teaching them then some other skills, right? In communication and in advocacy. Uh, I had my, my mentor about speaking. She traveled the country, right? I never forget, she became my mentor because she said, uh, yeah, you can do this. She was like, Google paid me 20000 I said, how do you do that? <laughs> right? But anyway, we kept going along. I'll never forget she said this. The first time I heard her speak, she said, she was in front of a bunch of educators, and she said, when a student doesn't come to class for two class periods, do you send the attendance policy or do you send how you do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've experienced both. Maybe two, three professors asked me how I was doing. Most of the time it's attendance policy. That's a business. So just think that the stuff matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, we have snacks and stuff, so please help yourself. We're going to be hanging out here, and if you have any other questions, just let us know. And thank you so much again. Yeah, appreciate it. Ready for me? I am dead. <laughs> <laughs>